Good afternoon and welcome once again to our webinar series entitled Frontline Report, Autoimmune Liver Disease and the Pandemic. This webinar series has been made possible via collaboration between the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association and the Center for Autoimmune Liver Disease and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. My name is Craig Lambert. I'm the Executive Director for the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association and an adult hepatologist at Indiana University. I'm excited to introduce you to this ninth webinar in our series entitled Back to School in a Pandemic, an Expert Approach. But first, quickly disclosure from the AIHA. This series does not replace your primary physician, gastroenterologist, or hepatologist. We cannot diagnose, treat, or manage symptoms associated with AIH. We believe that any changes in treatment or therapy should only be done under the supervision and direction of your treating doctor or care team. In this webinar, we are very lucky to have insight and commentary about the risks of returning to school from two excellent physicians, Dr. Jim Squires and Dr. Josh Shapson, both with strong backgrounds in pediatrics as well as research. We all, including myself as a father of three school-aged children, have been looking forward to hearing their perspective of the pandemic, particularly how they are counseling their own patients about the risks of in-person school and the pandemic. Before we get their input, I also want to welcome our moderators, both previous contributors to our Frontline Report series, Christine Browner and Dr. Alex Mietka. Chris is a very active advocate for pediatric autoimmune liver disease research and education through a number of organizations. As a parent to a son with autoimmune liver disease, she has seen firsthand the challenges this pandemic has brought to those affected with these illnesses. Dr. Mietka is the medical director of the Pediatric Liver Transplant Program at University of Cincinnati. He also is a dedicated researcher in autoimmune liver diseases. Thank you very much, Dr. Lambert. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and to interv in, um, interview our two uh, great speakers um, and presenters this afternoon. Um, I would like to first introduce Dr. Squires. Um, Dr. Squires earned his medical degree from the University of Texas and went on to complete his training in general pediatrics at Cincinnati Children's Hosp Hospital Medical Center. Following residency, he completed fellowships in both pediatric gastroenterology and pediatric advanced transplant hepatology at CCHMC. He also completed a master's in clinical and transitional research during this time. Following his completion of his training, um, we lost Dr. Squires to CHOP, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in 2015, um, lucky them where he is currently an assistant professor in pediatrics and director of pediatric advanced transplant hepatology fellowship. So welcome Dr. Squires and thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you, Chris. And thank you, uh, Dr. Lambert and everybody. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. So um, I thought I'd just kick it right off with a question um, from one of the uh, AIHA members. She says, um, my daughter, my adult daughter with AIH um, lives in the New York area and has young children who could return to public schools. And she wants to know if um, you think they should return to school because she's concerned that they could bring the virus home, um, which has you know, been an issue that's been addressed in the media quite a bit. Um, and she's been under very strict quarantine um, advice from her medical team. So. What's your advice on that? Would you, um, do you think that she should be staying at home or having her children stay at home? So uh, I think it's an excellent question. And I, you know, I think I, I probably want to start, um, you know, the webinar off by, by noting that, you know, it's going to be very difficult to offer advice. Uh, you know, medical advice is going to be, I think, a challenge to uh, provide um, uh, f from our place, uh, you know, from afar. And I think that, um, you know, as with most conversations with COVID, I think we all have to recognize the limitations of the data uh, and, and that uh, almost any answer we give uh, will be framed by some data, but it is um, a small as to compared to uh, what we typically like when we are giving, um, you know, uh, guidance uh, as it relates to any disease in particular. Uh, you know, I think to, to direct to the, the, you know, the questions uh, specifically, you know, I think, um, you know, for children, and I, I'm a pediatrician first, right, what we know about COVID-19 in children is, um, you know, A, it seems to affect children uh, less as far as the degree of illness, uh, and I think a lot of that data has kind of come out of uh, the Asian countries, and there's been some large population studies and, you know, upwards of 2,000 kids that have looked at, uh, you know, how they get and transmit uh, and are affected by the virus. And I think the bottom line is that 
uh, all children can get the virus. All children seem to be able to transmit the virus. Uh, the children themselves seem to be much uh, less at risk of severe infection. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I'm part of another network, a transplant related network uh, that, that has been working a lot to try to provide guidance to, to that population as it relates to return to school. And I think that um, in those instances, uh, you know, we generally recommend where possible, um, uh, you know, children try to return to school uh, if the disease and or the immunosuppression is at a stable state. Um, and again, these recommendations are very fluid. I think, uh, you know, looking back at recommendations that came out in the early spring are different than recommendations that may be coming out now. And part of that is based on what we learned over that time period. My specific advice for the question is, you know, if, if uh, you know, for a parent with an autoimmune disease who's looking to send their children back to school, um, you know, I also think it's important to recognize that you know, these are very personal decisions that also need to be based on what is happening in, in individual communities uh, and what is happening uh, and what type of resources are available in individual school settings. And that's not going to be universal across the country. But I think um, in general, and I think some of this mirrors what the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics have kind of come out with recently, which is that, you know, we recognize the importance of school and in-school education for our children. Um, uh, you know, we, we think that uh, where possible and where certain situations are met, uh, distancing, masking, hand hygiene, uh, things of that nature, that, that being back in, in a school setting as long as uh, the transmission rate in that community is low, um, uh, is safe and is advisable. But again, that's going to be very, very uh, dependent. As far as to the particular patient at home with an autoimmune disease, uh, some of it does depend, we think, on, um, you know, what the status of that disease process is. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, in the transplant setting, we try to kind of categorize them as high risk, moderate, and low risk based on their degree of immunosuppression. Um, and I think, you know, taking a step back from that and recognizing that there's very little data in these particular populations that we can draw from. But I think in a patient that's on relatively stable immunosuppression, uh, you know, we would put that in the you know, low, moderate to mild risk and would not recommend any additional, um, uh, you know, protections need to be warranted. But these all are, again, are on the backdrop of comfort level of an individual patient and family and recognizing that um, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think care teams are looking to support their patients in whatever way possible to make sure that they can come to that decision uh, with themselves and their schools uh, and their families, uh, you know, as informed as possible. Thanks, Dr. Squires. Um, I know as a, as a parent of a child with autoimmune liver disease, it's really confusing um, to know the right thing to do. So um, I know a lot of parents are just, it's, it's stressful decisions. So thanks for your advice on that. Um, Alex, um, Dr. Mitki, do you want me, I'll turn it over to you, excuse me. Alex, I'll turn it over to you now um, to introduce our next speaker and ask the next, next question. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jim, very much. Yeah, it's, it's my uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce our uh, second speaker and guest today. This is Dr. Josh Shefson. He is an infectious disease pediatrician and directs infection prevention and control program at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. He is originally from Philadelphia and he has completed his clinical training in Cincinnati and in a specific epidemiologic training with the CDC in Albany, New York. He lives in Cincinnati with his wife, Jenny, and daughter, Fiona. And uh, Josh and I have uh, done our pediatric residency here together in Cincinnati. So I will refer to him as Josh. Uh, Josh, uh, before, before I go to one of our uh, viewers and uh, patient family members' questions, um, I would like uh, to perhaps ask you for some uh, additional detail to uh, Dr. Squire's comment on the um, local situation. What is the, uh, uh, what is the situation in terms of uh, a prevalence of the virus and infection? Do you have any recommendation for families to assess yep. what is a low risk, intermediate, high risk based on uh, yep. uh, epidemiologic data which are available online? Yeah. Wonderful question. Thanks very much, Alex and, and Chris and everybody uh, for having me on. So I, I totally agree with what Dr. Squires, I get to call him Jim because he was a resident when I was in attending as well. But uh, what Jim was saying, um, I think the way that, that we've been framing it is there's 
we can define risk, but families need to define the risk tolerance. How much risk are they willing to tolerate? And so then the next question is, well, how do I define the risk? How do I know? And one of the factors is going to be the epidemiologic data. Others will be, what is the school doing? So masking, distancing, hand hygiene, et cetera. And then others will be your personal family. How do you guys feel? So in terms of the epi epidemiologic data, there is an enormous amount of data available online. Um, the challenge with it is to figure out how relevant it is to your corner of the world. So for example, we live in Ohio. Um, if we look at all of Ohio data, it's really not representing what's happening in Cincinnati necessarily because we have large population centers elsewhere. So ideally, we'd want to look more in the region of Cincinnati, but if you get too small, you're talking about too few people and you're not really able to generalize. What we've tried to do is um, we at Cincinnati Children's have collaborated with our local health departments and we're trying to put out specific measures that will help guide people. The primary measure is the um, rate of positive cases per 100,000 population. So what that does is that normalizes to how many people live in a certain area. And really the cutoff is somewhere around 10. Less than 10, if precautions can be followed at schools, depending on, on the age, on the situation, et cetera, then we would say that hybrid learning or in-person learning should be um, considered. Higher than 10, you should consider not to. Higher than 25, absolutely not. That should be closed. Less than one, continue the precautions. The precautions won't go away, but that's very, very low transmission. This is a new measure that folks have put forward and we're gonna put it to the test once we open schools. Um, but I think from a parent point of view, what I would say is um, you wanna look on your local health department's uh, website, start there, your county or your city, and look and see what kind of data they're showing. Um, and you can ask them specifically, what are the measures you're looking for in schools? People are manning these emails, they're, they're trying to pay attention to them. Many states will have a back to school plan. It all depends on the public health infrastructure locally and state wide. Um, but that's where I would start. I would start at your local and then go to your state health department. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it can be challenging, but I think that many communities are doing the same thing we're doing, which is trying to get that information out to people so they can make good decisions. Josh, this is fantastic. One, 10, 25. I think that's something for all of us to remember. Uh, you know, it, it sounds like you don't care too much about the R value, uh, which uh, so many of us have looked at the, the R value obsession. Oh, oh no, I care about the R value cases. as well. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there, so, is there, is there an easy cutoff for the R value? Less than yeah, one. one. Less than okay, one. Good. So, so, uh, so Alex is referring to the, the R value is a, is a rough measure of transmissibility of an agent, meaning that the, the, the basic explanation is if one person is infected, how many additional people will be infected? So for example, it's also called the R naught. For measles, it's 12 to 14. For flu, it's two to three. And because COVID is actively transmitting, we're able to measure it in communities to say how active the disease is. So um, the goal is to keep the R value below one, but very importantly, and, and thank you for bringing this up, in the same way that I imagine autoimmune hepatitis doesn't involve one lab measure or one piece of data, it, it's a lot of different data together, we're trying to figure out what that bundle of data is. So one of the factors is cases per 100,000 population, and it's a seven-day average. And then consider your R value, consider outbreaks within your area, consider um, outbreaks within schools. I mean, there's, there's lots of different secondary measures. Um, the R value gets at, it, it's a similar measure to the frequency of disease. It's just really another way to look at the data. What you're gonna to wanna to see is it's going to fluctuate. It always does. Um, but if you can keep it at one or less than one, then your community is in. Positive cases less than 10, uh, our value less than one, and we are in pretty good shape. Less than 10 per 100,000. That's right. right. A seven day average, 
Yes. <laughs> great, great. All right. Uh, with that, with that uh, uh, cause and epidemiology, back to Chris. Okay, so I have another question for, I guess, Dr. Squires. Um, so one of the um, AIHA members wrote in saying that she's um, made, that their family's made the decision to keep their child at home, their child who has autoimmune hepatitis. Um, but then she's wondering, does she also then need to t keep her other children home? Does it make sense to send them but keep one home or does she need to keep everybody home? I, I mean, I think, again, another really great question. And I think one that a lot of families uh, of children with chronic illnesses are struggling with. Uh, you know, this fall as schools are reopening. You know, I think there was a, there was a recent best practice uh, guideline put forth by, um, uh, you know, a group of infectious disease doctors. Um, uh, I think uh, some of Dr. Meathke and Shafson's colleagues are on it, uh, as well as some of mine. Uh, again, it's mostly looking at solid organ transplant recipients. Uh, and, you know, their recommendations in that are to know you should not necessarily keep siblings um, uh, at home uh, if that seems to be the best decision for the family. Um, now, again, I think there are considerations to be made based on a, uh, you know, a case by case basis. Um, uh, but I think that, you know, uh, you know, we all have, I think, recognized the importance of school from a, a developmental and mental health uh, standpoint um, uh, and psychological standpoint. Uh, you know, particularly from the experience in the spring. And I think that, um, again, you know, I, I will often say, depending on the local situations, uh, you know, the resources available at your school uh, and the stability of the high-risk child in the home, um, you know, I think that if, if, those, if certain measures um, uh, are met, uh, I think that sending siblings uh, to regular in-person school, uh, as long as they are, you know, careful, cautious, you know, then come home, wash their hands, uh, and, and um, you know, practice uh, safe, safe hygiene and, and, and other practices uh, you know, should be something that, that, as we know it now, would be safe and okay to do. Dr. Shavzen, do you have any, any other comments on that? No, I, I completely agree. I think it's an individual family. There are benefits to kids going to school, and if measures are being followed at school and transition to home to protect everybody in the home are being followed, then, you know, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to send siblings as well. George, let me, let me continue and also again uh, um, expand a little bit on what uh, Jim mentioned. Mench Jim mentioned that uh, lots of transplant programs have sort of some tips for their solid organ transplant recipients which we use an approximation for our immunocompromised patient with autoimmune hepatitis and those with PSC who, who require uh, immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, you know, I have, a, I have that tip sheet from our center here. Uh, we will upload that on our Facebook site later. And it, it has very handy uh, five, five uh, aspects they, they want us to remember. Keep a safe distance, clean your hands frequently, ask your school questions, stay home if you are sick. And then in the end, it has um, no which mask to wear. And that was also a question of our viewers. Uh, masks have been in the news recently. What are the best types of masks to wear and which ones should be avoided? And um, our, our uh, tip sheet re refers to surgical masks, three-ply disposable masks, and it recommends that those who at a higher risk uh, should wear them uh, all the time. Uh, can you help us guiding our viewers between yep. cloth mask, disposable mask, N95, and yep. are there any which should be avoided because they are not safe? Yeah, yeah, wonderful, wonderful question. So um, the, the context of this is um, some of it is evidence in practice um, based on other viruses a little bit for COVID-19. Um, and then the rest is done in the laboratory. What, what we know is that cloth masks are effective in public, but not in healthcare. Um, and that's, it's not known if it's because the masks tend to get soiled or uh, because of moisture. It, it's unclear why. But for that reason, the uniform recommendation is that in healthcare, at least cloth masks be worn. And so that's where, if we're going for a level of protection that's consistent, then cloth masks are the right choice. An N95 respirator, um, 
there are two ways to wear it. One is fit tested, so I would have to shave this thing off and then have it sealed around my mouth. And the problem with those N95s is that that restricts airflow and they can be very uncomfortable. Uh, as somebody who's tried to wear them for more than a half an hour or an hour, um, you become short of breath, you become very uncomfortable and you need a break. So from a kid's point of view, it's really impractical to try to wear that respirator. Now you can wear it as a mask, but then you ask the question, is it any better than a mask? If it's not sealed, is it really giving better filtration? And it may be more trouble than it's worth. And so that's, again, where you land on cloth mask as opposed to a respirator. You don't want to use an N95 respirator in anybody with chronic lung disease or underlying issues because that will make it even harder for them to breathe through it. They can become lightheaded um, and they could pass out. So you don't want to even start there. Now, a lot of the media, um, they've been citing different studies about cloth masks and about the, the neck gaiter things. Um, all of these studies are what we call low quality evidence. They're all observational, they're all very small, um, and they haven't been put to the test the same way that Jim was saying that there just isn't an abundance of data. There hasn't been enough time. A good study takes two years at least to do, and COVID's been in existence for eight months. So what, we've, what we try to do is we try to glean as much as we can from the literature. Um, and so I think that the jury is out on the gators as to whether or not they're effective. Um, but it's probably reasonable to avoid them because we're recommending to avoid cloth masks in immunocompromised patients. Now, when it comes down to it, a cloth mask in a social situation is probably adequate protection for most, if not all people. So depending on the stability and depending on the degree of immune compromise, I think the choice ends up being a, a, cl a cloth mask or a surgical disposable paper mask. Um, you know, if I can ask one more question before we go back to Jim. Uh, it's see, one, one other aspect is now more and more added to those five cornerstones of uh, protection, which is ventilation, adequate ventilation. Yeah. Is there something you, you would recommend the parents and the students to ask their school to do? Is there, is there, a, is yeah. there a, a benefit? So, so ventilation is one of those things that it can't hurt if your ventilation is adequate. Um, but how do you get your ventilation adequate? So the concept is if you're in a car, a closed car windows up for hours on a road trip, the risk of transmission will increase. And that's known for tuberculosis. And so it's assumed for COVID-19. I mean, it, it would likely follow a similar pattern. If you open the windows, you create flow and dilution. And so the risk is lower. The transmission of outside versus inside, just as an overall statement, is lower outside. Um, but when you talk about schools, school buildings are uh, of different ages. Their HVAC systems are of different functionality. And what, what schools would do is they would turn up the flow of the air. Uh, and the technical term is air changes per hour. So how often the air turns over in a room. And typically it's only gonna be around three or five, which is fine and very comfortable. Um, but some would say we should turn it up, we should make it more closer to 10. In the hospital, we can make modifications like that because we have experts and because our systems are very sophisticated and we build them that way. In a school, it's, it could lead to more trouble. So number one, it's going to make more noise the air flowing through as well as the machines working. So it may make learning very difficult. The second is we don't know the status or the cleanliness of the machine itself. So it may blow out a lot of dust in it, which is not really what we want. And the third is that it could cause the machinery to break down altogether, which is really the opposite of what we're hoping for. So if there are opportunities to modify HVAC, if there are opportunities to open windows, um, been terrific. One way that you can think about getting better ventilation in classrooms is keeping the door open, even part of the way. That would change a huge amount um, and help draw more air in from the building. So from my point of view, when we talk about, we have our little four-piece 
bundle for schools in order of importance, ma uh, distancing, masking, hand hygiene, and cleaning, we add ventilation on as a number five, saying it's a reasonable consideration. Certainly you don't want to sit in an in enclosed space with no airflow, but most classrooms are not going to be that way. And so if there's a way to increase the flow, terrific, it probably doesn't hurt, but there's a lot of downside to it in terms of the dust that's on the floor, that's in the walls, that's all around. So just taking those considerations into account. Thank you. Chris, back to you. Dr. Squires, um, this next question came from a uh, parent who has autoimmune hepatitis, not their child. And their <laughs> seven-year-old child, like most seven-year-olds, is like really active and wants to play sports. Um, and she was, she or he was asking about hockey and basketball specifically, but really any indoor sport. Um, she or he, the parent is concerned that when they pick the child up, they're riding in a car, um, they live with this child, obviously. Is it safe for the child to participate in these indoor sports? You know, I, I, thanks, Chris, for that, for that question and, and for the uh, submission. I, you know, th this is probably one of the most difficult that, that I think I personally struggle with. Um, you know, which, you know, uh, the short answer is we, it is impossible to, to quantify uh, risk here. Um, you know, and I think, you know, when you ask a healthcare provider uh, for their opinion on a question like this, the answer you get will be framed from the healthcare perspective. Uh, and, you know, it is always easy to default to the safest thing for everybody is to not let the child play, uh, to continue to try to keep uh, isolation as much as possible. Um, my guess is uh, this seven-year-old's Little League will not be taking precautions like the NBA, where there's a bubble in Disneyland uh, with every player getting tested, uh, you know, multiple times a day. Um, with all the other precautions that are taken into place. And so it is impossible to expect uh, sports teams to socially distance while they are playing. Um, uh, and so this comes down to one of the things that I think Josh and I have mentioned several times, which is, you know, what is going to be the, the risk benefit ratio that a particular family is willing to accept um, uh, for their child or their family to partake in, uh, you know, any one of these activities. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, th this is where, um, you know, I, I you know, you, you want the child to kind of be returned to, returning to normal for as much as possible. Uh, I would go back to, you know, I think probably, uh, you know, the framework that was put forth, uh, again, with that solid organ transplant recommendations, which is, you know, I think uh, if, a, if a parent is at a stable state in their disease, if they're on, uh, you know, minimal immunosuppression that hasn't been changed recently, uh, if there is, you know, you know, no recent flare or increase in their immunosuppression that they've had to undertake. Um, probably the risk there then is no more than would be in the general population. Um, but I think you can remove autoimmune hepatitis from this question entirely. And I still think it's a good question <laughs> uh, that, that a general pediatrician would, would struggle with, right? Which is, do we allow, um, you know, instances where clearly you can't social distance, uh, you know, maybe you could have kids with masks, but that's going to be tough when they're running around trying to be active. Um, you know, should we allow these activities to um, return? Uh, and, and I think we're all struggling with this. You know, I think you know, here I'm going to really kind of hedge and say, I don't know. Uh, and I don't think we know. Um, and I think that you're going to have to balance, uh, you know, several different factors uh, as, as this family makes this decision. Thanks. And I would, I, really would, I, would, I would love to hear Josh's opinion on that as well. My opinion is your opinion. I thought you said it perfectly. Sports is a huge part of so many people's lives, parents and children. It's been traditional. It's a great way to get exercise. It's a great way to interact socially. It's a great way to learn how to win and how to lose and how to be gracious, all these things. It has great benefits. What makes me nervous is it's, it's uncontrolled. It's co controlled chaos, right? So it's, it's during a basketball game, there has to be somebody to make sure that people aren't hitting each other, tripping each other, pushing each other. That by nature, there's going to be close interactions. Ice hockey, even more so. Um, and so I think really the answer is none of us really know there's a push because this is when sports typically start and and teams have been practicing and their normal is now we go out and we play other teams 
and everybody is really, really wanting to get back to normal because um, we just want this to be over. But I think that there isn't enough knowledge. All we know is the professional sports. And as Jim said, that's simply not practical um, for anybody else. Plus, if you look at baseball, there have been a number of outbreaks amongst those teams. So it's not perfect. It's not a perfect system. Um, so I, I really think that we don't know. Um, I wish I knew more because I wish I could advise. What I would love to see is sports organizations to not push so much for the usual timing, but to give it a little bit of time. Let's let kids get back to school. Let's focus on individual exercise or, or team practicing. And let's see if we can learn from each other about how competitive sports might work. But in the end, it, it's a risk benefit, it's a risk tolerance, and it's a, it's a personal decision. Um, Josh, let me uh, ask you a, a question here directly, uh, which is probably not uh, directly related to back to school, but very much on the mind of one of our uh, patients and uh, participants in our uh, frontline webinar. What is the latest on how COVID-19 impacts pregnant women and their unborn babies? Yeah, uh, yeah, good question. So, so folks have been watching this very closely, um, especially in the wake of Zika. Um, we know that some viruses can affect uh, fetuses, they can affect the mothers as well. Um, and there have been some really uh, very upsetting stories in the news about um, new mothers and severe illness. The, the bottom line with COVID and pregnancy is that the jury is still out, although there does not appear to be a significant effect on the fetus and on the newborn child. So compared to CMV, which can cause a congenital infection, um, COVID doesn't appear to have a congenital infection. Time will tell, but a lot of people have gotten COVID, a lot of pregnant women um, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence on that side. Now for women who are pregnant, um, there's mixed data. Um, and part of that is because what COVID can do when it's severe is it can throw an inflammatory cascade, which can affect the coagulation um, system. So the blood clotting, and if too many clots form, it can affect the placenta. Um, and it can affect the mother's um, health status. And that's sort of been a focus where some mothers who have become infected immediately prior to delivery have ended up with very severe disease. Um, and the CDC published data not too long ago that said that overall, if you compare pregnant women to women um, aged 15 to 44, that the risk of severe outcome is higher amongst pregnant women. Um, but that's kind of true for everything, including swollen feet. Um, so it's, it's hard to know exactly. Many folks are recommending um, a very careful behavior towards the term of the pregnancy, um, both to protect the mother as well as to ensure that the mother and the baby can uh, bond immediately. Early on, there was arguments for separation of baby and mother. That is no longer the case. The recommendation is to get the baby breastfeeding and bonding with the mother. That's the best for the child. The mom can wear a mask. Um, but so to summarize, we see it when we talk about pregnancy in our employees, we see it in a similar class of as CMV, which not of the disease that it causes, but of the way to prevent it. So standard precautions, good hand washing, masking, distancing to prevent the transmission of it. There's nothing special about it. It doesn't appear to affect the fetus and it's, it could affect a woman severely. And if that woman is pregnant, it could create complications, but um, there's no specific evidence that uh, pregnant women are targeted somehow or have some syndrome that is particularly severe. Josh, along thank those, you very much. Along those same lines, um, uh, one of the um, patients has asked about her pregnancy um, and her upcoming um, newborn, that her, both her, um, her practitioner and her pediatrician um, are giving sort of opposite advice. One is saying, 
you know, after you have the baby, you need to quarantine um, for two months for your safety and the newborn safety. And another one is saying, you know, you're fine to have visitors as long as, you know, everybody wears a mask. Um, so the question is, um, why are there so many differing opinions on this? Yeah. Um, so, so two reasons. One is what we've been saying all along, which is there's an enormous amount of uncertainty when it comes to COVID. And it is very hard to separate risk tolerance from risk definition. So um, a more conservative physician will say, shut it down. Uh, a, more, a less conservative, but not, not dangerous, but a less conservative physician will say, go for it, just do what you need to do. Um, and that's really true for, for many things. So it's tricky when you get multiple opinions, but it's also not surprising. It's something that, um, you know, Jim was saying, if you asked a physician, it's, it's the joke of ask three physicians, you'll get six opinions. Um, I mean, that's, that's going to be the nature of the beast. I think that in general, what I would say is when I think about newborns, I think about cocooning, so keeping the family together and trying to protect the child in that first few weeks of life. I think that immediate family, you know, sharing with the family, I mean, the good news is Zoom works great. People can see the child, but, but to make sure that things are bonding, that things are going well, there are all kinds of risks, postpartum um, mood changes, is your breast milk supply coming in, is the other child coping? Like you may not need those added stressors. Um, in terms of protecting from infection, it's, it's really just um, trying to protect within those first few weeks. Nobody who is sick can come to the house, period. Anybody who comes to the house is masking and, of course, washing their hands. Um, somebody wants to hold the baby, that's fine. Go wash your hands. Um, and then try to build from there, and it'll end up being a comfort level. That's what we've been recommending for, um, for pretty much ever uh, when it comes to babies, because they can be vulnerable to lots of different things. And I think, I think the same principles apply for COVID. Alex, you're up next. Yep, uh, I you know I uh, let me ask you a question uh, uh, for myself that I which I uh, found interesting uh, based on a, a recent press release from our hospital, and I was wondering whether any of you has uh, experience with it. Apparently, Children's Hospital released a, a COVID anxiety app, which is a digital coach for navigating troubled times, and it was uh, developed by University of Cincinnati and the company, and. Uh, I, I checked this out. It's, uh, it's neat. It basically, you, you express your anxiety and an, an AI-based chatterbox replies to you and tries to talk you through this, how you, how you develop positive energy out of your anxieties. Uh, does it work? Has anyone seen it in use? Do you guys recommend? I think we are all preparing ourselves that School is a huge stress factor anyway. We all know that the emergency room, they, uh, they will see an increase in number of patients in the normal year. So it, 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 has to, it has to be an additive stress in an already stressful situation. Uh, can you both perhaps give me an, uh, some idea of how you, what you recommend for dealing with that stress for our students and their parents? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, 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 I'm happy to turn this first. I mean, I, you know, this is, again, one of, one of these critical factors that is universal uh, and extends beyond, um, you know, uh, uh, the realm of, of children, families, uh, you know, uh, dealing with chronic, uh, chronic diseases. Um, you know, although clearly chronic disease exacerbates that stress, uh, you know, and I don't think that that should be, um, uh, you know, ignored or, or put on the shelf. But, you know, I think, um, you know, this pandemic is affecting Every, you know, every single person, I think it, it's fair to say. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the Cincinnati app, uh, you know, I think is, is an excellent example. I think many uh, institutions, um, you know, within and outside of medicine, right? I mean, I think this extends into the business world. This extends into, uh, you know, every facet of kind of the, uh, you know, uh, American culture. Um, you know, I think that, that there are uh, uh, resources that are being made more available um, to help with how various, you know, people are coping with this, um, you know, and I think, 
you know, maintaining, uh, you know, the, 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 the social structure as much as possible can help with some of those things. And, you know, again, a lot of these apps feed into, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, red flags that will, you know, kind of uh, will, will pop up to, to the various, you know, app owners or whatever, uh, so that in, in cases where there's, you know, real help that's needed, um, it can be kind of extended uh, to, to that particular responder. Uh, you know, I think, you know, this is a little bit of a sidebar, right? But, you know, I think even on this call a lot, you know, we've been talking about social distancing, social distancing, and how important social distancing is. You know, one of my colleagues here who's a, a, a transplant infectious disease doctor, you know, he, he has kind of made it a, a little bit of his mission to change that from social distancing uh, to physical distancing, because we don't need social distancing. Social distancing, you know, social interaction is critically important. Uh, what we need is physical distancing, um, you know, and I think, again, that's just kind of one example where, you know, people are trying to, uh, you know, recognize how this pandemic is really affecting all of us, uh, not just on a health standpoint, uh, but but on a, a mental and psychological standpoint. And so I think, um, you know, I, I would encourage the use of an app like the Cincinnati app, I think, for people who are out there who are, uh, you know, struggling with uh, anxiety and um, uh, stress you know, to, to look towards their local resources and, and you know, uh, even just being able to kind of Google some of these things, uh, you know, to, to see, um, you know, how, how others are dealing with this, I think is an, I think is an important uh, resource and important to recognize that, uh, you know, these feelings are absolutely normal. Um, and I think that's a big step in then trying to figure out how we can address them and, uh, and, and mitigate them as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I think that's wonderful. And I love the physical versus social distancing. Um, you know, the, the introverts uh, of the world uh, may have enjoyed the first couple of weeks of silence, but it gets, it gets old after. Um, I love the app. I think it's wonderful. It's a great intervention for situational anxiety, which is what most people are experiencing. It's completely normal. It's a huge change. And there's a lot of... Um, a lot of unsurety. Just people are not sure what's going to happen. And, and people try to ask me all the time, and I don't know either. Um, and so I think having things like that app, having things out in the open, talking about things, finding safe places to talk about things, seeking out professional help, working with your existing team to talk about the mental health aspects um, of chronic disease, let alone acute events, um, is really good holistic management and makes a lot of sense. I'd like to move the conversation a little bit away from COVID for a second. Um, we received a question <laughs> like that. We, we, I just got a thumbs up from um, Dr. Schaff, Schaffson. Um, no more talking about pandemic for a second. Um, so this, this question um, relates to kids that are going away to college that have autoimmune liver disease. And, you know, no parent likes to think that their child is going to go and um, party and drink beer and, and, and smoke marijuana, but um, the reality is is that that does sometimes happen. And um, this parent is wondering um, how bad is alcohol or marijuana use on the liver, and is it okay if their child experiments a little bit? Yeah, I guess I'll take this one from the infectious disease doctor. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the short answer is, you know, whenever we're dealing with children uh, with underlying liver disease, we talk about a healthy liver lifestyle. Uh, you know, and there are, you know, kind of very clear party lines that we will advise in our children uh, and their you know, families to, to look to avoid as children get older. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, the, 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 the big ones are obviously weight and alcohol. Um, you know, uh, the, the way I kind of see it is, you know, uh, a liver with autoimmune hepatitis or a patient with autoimmune hepatitis, even well controlled, you know, this liver already kind of has, you know, one hit against it, if you will. Um, you know, even though for all intents and purposes under, under uh, you know, appropriate therapy, these livers uh, look very, very well. You know, the last thing I want in my patient is for them to voluntarily, or at least in an avoidable way, uh, you know, do something that's going to injure this liver anymore. Uh, and so uh, I fully recognize uh, that, that my words maybe don't uh, carry all that much weight uh, to an 18-year-old who's going off to college, but I would fully recommend avoiding alcohol, uh, if at all possible, when at all possible. Um, you know, is there a safe uh, amount to have? Um, th there is probably a minimal safe amount to have, but I think that muddies the water. 
uh, to be perfectly honest. And I think maintaining a message of, you know, alcohol is not uh, something that is needed in our lives. Uh, and I think uh, where and if at, at all possible, avoiding alcohol is going to be critically important. Um, Marijuana is a little bit uh, uh, interesting and actually a little bit different uh, in that, you know, there isn't a lot of great data about what marijuana does on the liver. Again, alcohol, we know what, uh, you know, long-term alcohol use can do to a liver, uh, and it's a, it's a terrible thing. Marijuana, there isn't a lot of data on, on what, uh, you know, marijuana does to livers. You know, there are, you know, the, the, the um, you know, the chemical receptor for marijuana is, is something called a cannabinoid receptor. And, you know, cannabis, again, is, a, is one of the active ingredients in marijuana. You know, there are receptors, these cannabinoid receptors in the liver. Uh, there has been some studies on, um, uh, you know, how these receptors are activated in certain underlying liver diseases and liver, liver disorders. Uh, you know, we know that there can be effects on the GI tract from smoking marijuana. I think cyclic vomiting uh, is the kind of classic one that we see sometimes. Um, uh, but we know in other diseases, such as inflammatory bowel disease, uh, smoking marijuana can improve at least their physical symptoms. Uh, there's very little data that it actually improves, you know, the inflammation uh, that causes autoimmune bowel disease. Um, uh, so I think that, you know, uh, I still think from a public health standpoint, you know, uh, avoidance is going to be the party line, you know. Uh, should you take up smoking marijuana? No, you should not. Uh, should you take up drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes? No, you should not. These probably th are things that are not going to be healthy. Uh, alcohol, I think it's easy to, to very firmly say there's no safe level that someone without immune hepatitis should be partaking in. I think marijuana, uh, maybe it's a little bit more difficult to say that definitively, but I think just from a general health standpoint would never um, uh, recommend or advocate its use, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the setting of, uh, you know, just autoimmune hepatitis or other, you know, generalized care. Thanks, Dr. Squires. Uh, Chris, perhaps I can, I can add uh, one or two comments on the Mariana question. Uh, I, I totally agree with Jim, uh, and he mentions the cannabinoid uh, receptor. So uh, it depends on the type of patient, of course, uh, 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 it, it, it was found to be antipyritic. So since this is also a, a conference for uh, uh, patients with P PSC, at least in children, um, and some of them has a, a severe pruritus itching, uh, that, that uh, in a medical setting that has been actually exploited, whether uh, the recreational use is therefore recommended, that's, that's a different story. But coming back to... Uh, also considerations you have to take in, in terms of safety. Uh, you have to be careful with inhaled, uh, whether it is uh, any, any uh, uh, things which, which you inhale in terms of uh, exposing an immunocompromised patient to uh, additional risks and uh, infectious risks uh, from inhaling uh, marijuana or other um, sources. And then uh, lastly, uh, we had one uh, frontline review and uh, it was uh, an, a wonderful presentation by one of our patients with autoimmune hepatitis and she mentioned that she was on a uh, tacrolimus program for her autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, the program levels uh, are affected by uh, marijuana. So depending on what medications you are on, um, it would be very important to take that into consideration. That would be another reason to stay away from it. Uh, very difficult to persuade physicians to come up with a, a list of reasons in favor of uh, yeah. getting overweight, drinking alcohol, and smoking marijuana. Although, um, you know, um, Alex, if you don't mind, because I mean, I, I do think that, you know, there, there, there's still another important part of, you know, I, I think, you know, marijuana is clearly um, uh, a... Uh, a therapy, right, uh, that, that I think is, is unexplored in many different settings. And I do think that the, the kind of the, the social movements on marijuana, uh, you know, uh, away from, um, you know, being a legal illicit drug shouldn't take away from the potential therapeutic benefits that could be explored uh, for various things. I, I just don't think we have a full understanding of some of the, the capacity with which marijuana can be beneficial. Uh, I think what Alex points to, and I think really what, what I think my initial answer was framed in, is that, you know, when you talk about, you know, a, a college kid smoking marijuana, you, you probably aren't thinking that this is a controlled substance that has been through the rigors of, um, you know, a, a, a certified lab or the FDA stamp, you know, certification process and things like that. So you just don't know what's in it. Um, but I think if you take that aside and you just look at, 
um, you know, the active ingredients, the THCs and the other components of marijuana that may have some uh, benefit for overall health. You know, I think those are areas that, that are rich for further exploration and I fully support exploration into them. I just think that, you know, we need more data. And then once that data begins to emerge, I think it needs to be, um, uh, you know, uh, you need to have, you know, someone who's kind of overseen that comfortably uh, to be able to help an individual with, you know, dosing and, uh, you know, administration, how it's going, you know, whether it's, uh, again, inhaled or, uh, you know, a pill or a chewable or an oil or something like that. So I think, um, you know, there, there are avenues that need exploration. And I, I think that we should all be, you know, encouraged uh, for uh, any avenue that's going to ultimately help our patients safely. Perhaps a clinical trial, Jim. Chris, is that okay if I... Uh perhaps finish with uh, one last viral question, going back to the virus. And uh, uh -oh. hopefully... can I add something about marijuana? <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I think, I think, Jim, I think I love what you're saying. I think that for now, what, what people need to realize is you have to be very careful about what you put into your body. And that's across the board. You wouldn't buy moonshine from a guy in, a, in an alley. You would buy alcohol if you were to drink alcohol, which you shouldn't. But you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, if you're, if you're using recreational marijuana, you have no idea what's in it. There are fungi in it, there are chemicals in it, there are things that have nothing to do with cannabinoids um, that really could be potentially harmful. And I think it's a shame, but I completely agree that if you can get any substance condition, something in a safe way that you know what's in it, um, that could, that could potentially give benefit. I, I think that's a great thing, area for research. All right, sorry, back to the virus. Back to the virus. Um, and uh, a, again, a question from one of our uh, patients. Realistically, when do you think a vaccine will be available? When do you think life will return to normal? Uh, and let me add uh, the third question. Should patients who are on immunosuppressive therapies be careful uh, uh, with part participating in clinical trials yeah. for vaccines? Yes. Okay. Well, so very simple questions. Uh, clearly, I have all the answers. All right. So the first is um, a vaccine. Everybody wants to know. Um, and, and truthfully, um, I can't give you a date. My thought is it's going to be longer than what most people are predicting. And the reason for that is not um, because I, I don't think they will find successful vaccines. I think it's that I would like to see safety profiles in large scale studies. I would like to see some post-marketing surveillance, um, which is really standard for vaccines um, before I can make a recommendation, especially for high-risk groups. Um, the, the, the trials are designed to say whether or not the, the vaccine causes an immediate issue and then whether or not it protects against the infection. But it's always small scale compared to the world's population, which would be the eligible population. For this. So the safety profile is going to be really tough. How long? I, I'm looking for my crystal but I don't have it. So I would say it's going to be a while. In terms of participating in trials, I would think that right now it's only for healthy individuals. So I would discourage folks from um, participating just because you have no idea and you don't even know in terms of the placebo, again, putting things in your body. My thought is that um, trials are not being conducted in those populations because they're focusing on generally healthy individuals. Um, the second question was life back to normal. So I have bad news for everybody. Life will not go back to normal, but it doesn't mean that life won't go on. So if you think about it, think back I don't know how old the audience is, but I'm, I'm old. And so I think back 10 years, 20 years, the world is different. I'm different. Things are different. Things have changed. The key is they've changed slowly over time. And while I try to reject that, I end up accepting it and accepting that I'm in a new normal, right? I'm not going to play ice hockey. Mm -mm. And I and that's, uh, came to that realization slowly but surely. And with COVID, it's so difficult because the change happens so quickly and so comprehensively. So it happened to everybody almost at once. Um, very shocking, and that's where the anxiety comes in. But it's no different than gradual change that happens over time, and these things happen. Um, so what we need to think about is COVID is here. We don't know what it's going to be next. Could be better, may not be better, maybe the same. 
Um, and so what we need to do is think about what was I trying to achieve with these things that I want to do? So, you know, you take contact sports, it's the competition, it's the exercise, it's the interaction, it's the travel, it's the, the adrenaline, it's, it's the whatever. And then you ask, how can I make that happen post COVID? Um, we think about it with school, we think about it with our socialization, we think about it with um, absolutely everything we would do. And I would encourage, just from my personal point of view, what I've been trying to do is to focus on that and on moving forward and not on not spending as much time reminiscing of the good old days, i.e. November 2019, um, because I, I don't think that things will ever be the same but I don't think they were going to be anyway. So I don't, I don't know how helpful that is, but I, I think when people use the word new normal, um, I think it's accelerated change and a challenge to respond to that change um, quickly. It's going to take us all time, but I think it has to be done deliberately and, and very much out in the open. Josh, Jim, thank you very much, uh, very much for uh, your expert, um, Concert advice and recommendations uh, for taking the time and uh, informing uh, us and our viewers. I learned a lot. Chris, uh, I, you, you are on this here. You, you, I'm sure you learned a lot too. Um, I did. Thank you all very much for taking the time. As a, as a right. parent of a, of a child with um, autoimmune liver disease, I really appreciate your candid um, approach and discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks bye for bye. the opportunity. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you all, and special thanks again to our expert doctors, Dr. Squires and Shafson, as well as our moderators, Mrs. Browner and Dr. Mipka. Once again, our members provided our panelists a wide variety of challenging yet insightful questions about this pandemic, and I think the responses are very useful to us all as we try to weigh the risks of in-person school for our children. Finally, thank you to the collaborators of the AIHA, specifically the Center for Autoimmune Liver Disease and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We hope you'll join us again for our next webinar. See you then.